Hey, thank you for joining me today for our continued study in the Incarnation. What a thrill it is to be a part of service services during the Advent season. We want to make sure that we're um, just enjoying the beauty of the Incarnation together. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 today. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And please make sure that you have your communion elements ready at the end of the, the message, the teaching time. We'll take some time to pray together and have a time of communion. Reading from 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, reading from the NIV. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Let's pray. Father, over these next few minutes together, as we look at what it means to be a part of the Incarnation and look at the intent or the purpose of the Incarnation, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us. And then, Father, as we anticipate taking communion together, that we would sense and know the Holy Spirit's presence, your great love for us, wrapped up in the gift of your Son. Thank you for these moments together today. Bless them by the presence of your Holy Spirit and give us application for our life and for the environments we go to on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, back in 1991, Jack Palance and Billy Crystal starred in what I would call a midlife crisis comedy called City Slickers. A group of three friends led by Billy Crystal were kind of at a crisis point in their own individual experiences, and they decided to go to a what we would term a dude ranch and, and take on a two-week cattle drive. It seemed pretty innocuous to them, something completely outside their arena of comfort. And they went and they met Palance, who was this grizzled, quiet, gruff um, cowhand who was going to lead this experience. They were all kind of hoping to find themselves in the middle of this trail experience together. Well, Palance playing this intimidating cowboy leading the drive, he and Crystal somehow form a friendship during the experience. And in one exchange that, that most people feel is the highlight of the entire movie, they're talking together and Crystal's laying out his midlife crisis experience. And Palance in that quiet moment, in his grizzled voice, just says, there's one thing. There's that one thing that you need to be looking for. And it's interesting, that one thing becomes the quest for Billy Crystal. Not, not any kind of treasure, not any earthly experience, but just finding the one thing that he does well and the one thing that his entire life can be about. Now, it seems a little bit cryptic initially. There's no clear statement about what the one thing really is, but Crystal would know it when he found it. When he came across it in his own life experience, he would discover what the one thing was. Now, there are times when we are reading the Bible and the writers leave us with a cryptic quest to find that one thing that really matters. Well, John often gives us the one thing, sometimes in a little cryptic fashion. What I love about him in 1 John is there's nothing cryptic about it. It doesn't leave us wondering. In our text, there is one thing that really matters. There is a primary quest that all of our lives are supposed to center on and that changes everything about human existence. And that one thing is transformative. It can change society, it can change individuals. It invites us to a completely new way of viewing life. For John, the one thing was the incarnation and the intent of the incarnation, the goal of the incarnation. If we're recipients of God's love demonstrated through the incarnation, we will most naturally demonstrate that same love to those around us. It's God's recipe for revolution. He wants to change the world. What does he do? He sends his son as an example of his great love, and then he, he invites us to participate in living that life of love in front of other people so that people can be reconciled and put in right relationship with him. So we're going to take the next few minutes and consider the goal of the Incarnation and learn how it can transform us and the world around us. And I want to start with the goal itself. 
What is the goal of the Incarnation? Well, the goal of the Incarnation really is a life of love. A life of love. Verse 9 unlocks the reason behind why God sent His Son into the world. Why God became man. The Incarnation is central. It is a central demonstration of God's love for humanity. We certainly know the cross, and John brings that into the whole concept. But the Incarnation, without the Incarnation, there's no cross. The Incarnation is the initiation of the type of lifestyle that God wants us to live. In sending His Son, God made His love for us tangible, visible, accessible, relatable. Why did God do this? Well, at the end of verse 9, it makes it clear that we might live through Him. He made a different kind of life possible by sending His Son into the world. Life is the goal of the Incarnation, eternal life. And I'm not just talking about heaven, nor is John just talking about life after death. He's talking about eternal life that invades the here and the now. He sent his son into the world, made him flesh and blood, had him crucified that we might live and have eternal life and demonstrate his great love and his great life in the here and now. And that life, the life that it brings is anchored and centered in the one thing, and that is the love of God. Basically what John is saying in these verses is to live is to love. To live is to love. God envisions a specific type of life that's produced by sending Jesus. We certainly would call it eternal life. John does in, in the Gospel of John chapter 3. The Incarnation doesn't just merely add religious or a spiritual dimension to our existence. Its goal is not to make us more loving and less selfish. It's not to make us moral, though it does all of those things. When we receive the gift of life provided by the Incarnation, it transforms our very nature. Life becomes all about loving God and God, the, the love that God demands and that He deserves. In other words, all of life is wrapped up in loving God and loving those that He desires to see reconciled to Him. He, des he deserves, because of His sacrifice, a love response from us. And as we respond in love to Him, the door that opens up our heart to the love of God, to love God, also releases His love to other people. The sole purpose of our lives as believers is to love as we have been loved. I know it's, it's an impossibility, right? It's an eternal, unconditional love. But he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us divine intervention. If you read down in verse 13, he gives us divine intervention so that we can love in human capacity the way that Christ loved us. Our central focus, now that we're believers, is expressing the love of God to each other and especially to those who are not yet reconciled to the Father. And we can only live this way by being set free from self-interest. By being set free from self-interest. You know, verse 10 expands on um, the life of love found in verse 9. Verse 10 says this, This is love. Not that we loved God. It's not our love for God that matters but that He loved us. Everything is centered in God and His love. That He loved us and He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love is not what people do for themselves. Love is not what we dredge up from the depths of our internal being. We have to look beyond ourselves to access and express divine love. I don't have divine love inherently in me. You do not have divine love inherently in you. That happens as the Holy Spirit takes up residence after our conversion and, and he inundates us with the ability to love other people the way that Christ has loved. Human love is inadequate to transform our world. It does do some things, no doubt about it. We're made in the image of God. We have the capacity to love and that does impact, but the reality is that human love is inadequate to, to accomplish the purposes that God has and God's purpose is to redeem lost humanity and to reconcile them to himself. The incarnation invites us to experience and rely upon divine love that is provided for us by the Holy Spirit. Our deliverance from self-interest comes at the cross of Christ. He sent His Son, remember, incarnation and atoning sacrifice for our sins. Christ demonstrated selfless love at the cross. And the cross becomes the doorway to freedom from self-interested human love. It's the doorway where, by which we become other-interested, where we can act 
actually reach out and minister and bless those, minister to and bless those around us. Love as Christ loved you. None of us have that kind of love resident within us until the Holy Spirit takes up a residence inside of us. God's selfless love is not instinctive for human beings. It's made available by our faith in Jesus Christ and through the ongoing presence of the Spirit living within us. You know, the goal of the Incarnation is a life of love. <clears throat> this is what God has called us to, a life of love. God sent Jesus into our world that we might be transformed and become a living demonstration of his selfless love to others. So what are we? We are living demonstrations of the life of Christ the light of Christ, the love of Christ to those around us. And for that to happen, we have to be set free from self-interested love, the, the forms of love that, are, that we're accustomed to. Um, what, what a transactional love, conditional love. If you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. If you give me this, then I'll give you that. If you do this for me, then I'll love you this way. Those are all transactional. God doesn't love that way. God is love. He loves Period. We don't have to do things for him. He loves without condition. It's not transactional. The Spirit enables us to love that way, and he, tr he delivers us. When we repent of our sins, when we go through the process of sanctification, we are being delivered through the Holy Spirit, is delivering us, setting us free from our self-interested forms of love, and he's inundating us with the ability to love as Christ loved us. The bottom line is simply this, living a life of love is the effect of being loved. Living a life of love is the effect of being loved. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He loved us first. So being loved and being confident in the love of God enables us, empowers us to live a life of love toward other people. God loves sacrificially by Jesus, the incarnation of the crucifixion. He endured the cross and he carried our sins. And having been loved in this way, now we can love in the same way. The most natural thing for us to do is to love God and to love others in a comparable manner. One author states that the same door that opens to let out our love for God is the door that opens to let out our love for our neighbor. So we've experienced the love of God, therefore we want to express love toward God through obedience. And that obedience is most often found in the form of genuinely and unconditionally loving other people. When we experience the love of God, we are liberated from self-interested love, and we are given a reservoir, probably a better word be a spring of selfless love for other people. God loves us deeply, and now we're confident, we're not insecure, and we are what? We can now confidently love other people without expecting anything in return. We can love those around us the way that God intended us to love Him. He has called us to a life of love, to participate in love. The Incarnation invites us and empowers us to live in the love of Christ, and now we need to just examine the importance of practicing that kind of love. It is vital, it's central to Christianity, that we who name the name of Christ, who've been transformed by the love of God through Christ, also practice love on a regular basis. We're imperfect, that's, that's the caution, we're not going to be perfect at this, but we can, through the Holy Spirit's help and through our own obedience to God's commands, love other people the way that God, through Christ, has loved us. So what is the importance of practicing love? If we had to choose one thing, remember back to, 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 to Palance and to Crystal and City Slickers, there's one thing. Look for that one thing. If we had to choose one thing that Christianity is about, we would conclude it's about love, the love of God, not human transactional love, the love of God, being loved and loving sacrificially or unconditionally. Why is it so important for us to live by God's selfless love rather than this conditional transactional love that we're so accustomed to? Why is it important for us to see love as the one thing in Christianity? Why is love better than envy and strife and greed, lust and purity, addiction, violence? Why is love better than the gifts? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. What, is, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? If, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm just a noise. If I go to be burned at the stake, but have not love, right, it, it amounts to nothing. Love is above gifts. It's above sacrifice. Love is better than all of those things. Why is that? Why is it the one thing? Well, love is so important because God launched his plan in Jesus 
his demonstration of love, and he intends on completing it through you and I. Can you imagine that? He intends on completing his purposes and his plan through us. God is putting an awful lot of trust in us. He's making his presence, his love, his character, his works available to the world, not through himself, but through us. The embodied presence, the body of Christ, the embodiment of Jesus on the earth right now. Jesus' incarnation demonstrates God's love to an unredeemed world. The incarnation was the launch of God's redemptive, reconciling plan. And those who come to faith in Jesus Christ now join him and, and complete that work. Often the Apostle Paul talks about completing the works of Christ. That's what we're doing. We're, we are, through our witness, through our love, through our care, through our gospel sharing, we are completing the plan of God. If the incarnation was a demonstration of love, Love is God's primary redemptive strategy. And when we join in his mission, our primary strategy is also love. The love of God flowing through us, through our words, through our actions, through our attitudes, lets others know how much God loves them. It's important because God launched his plan in Jesus, and he's counting on you and I to do what? Carry out, to complete that incarnational redemptive plan, which is demonstrate my character, demonstrate my love. Love is also so important because our love makes God visible. Our love makes God visible to other people. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus, or now you look at one of his followers. Author N.T. Wright says this, As Jesus unveiled God before a surprised and unready world, so must we. Love is that important. Jesus unveiled God. We are unveiling God through what? Through our loving character, through our loving actions, through our loving words and attitudes. When we live in selfless love, by the strength of the Holy Spirit, we constantly present God's embodied love to those around us. We make God visible. We make God visible. We know Listen, it's not easy. There's no way this is a simple thing to do. It requires a calm, confident demeanor. It means that we face injustice and misunderstanding, persecution, and ridicule. Jesus did too. We're not above our teacher. It means sacrifice. Sometimes it means heartache. But all of it adds up to great joy because we're joining God in redeeming humanity and reconciling all things according to, uh, reconciling all things to him as Paul says in Colossians. Listen, it means that some people are going to awaken to the love of God for them. As we're loving them, they're going to see God and Jesus through us. They're going to see the nature of God in a way maybe they've never seen it before, and they're going to be reconciled to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Our selfless love makes God available. We are completing his plan. And finally, our love makes God accessible. Our love makes God accessible. You know, the other day I was wrestling with accessibility features on one of, one of our devices at home, whether it was, I don't know if it was a laptop or an iPad or a television. But your computer, your phone, your tablet, your TV all have accessibility features that help those maybe that are hearing impaired or sight impaired work on their computer, work on their tablet, work on their, on their television. For some reason, the device I was using was defaulting to speaking mode. Um, and so it was about, I couldn't see what was going on, and it was telling me what I was doing on the device as I was moving maybe the mouse around or whatever. All the actions I took were described to me by the device's internal narrator, you know, that kind of monotone narrator that all of these devices have. My device was attempting to make its features more accessible to me. Of course, I was frustrated because I can see I didn't need the accessibility. I had just accidentally got into some menu where the accessibility was turned on. Well, Christians, look at we're the accessibility feature for the world we live in. We're supposed to be making God more accessible to those whose sin impair their ability to see him and know him. We are supposed to be making him readily available to those who are having a tough time navigating life because their sins are impairing their ability to live for Christ and find fulfillment. They're not flourishing because... They haven't found God to be accessible. We are their accessibility connection. Our attitudes, our words, our actions should make it easier for our friends, family, co-workers, enemies to find God. Having been loved by God as we are, we know that the pathway to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. We have the wonderful purpose of 
helping God reconcile all things to himself. God forbid that we would make God less accessible or that we would make accessing God more difficult by our arrogant, pharisaical, wrong religious attitudes. God's love for us and our love for him should open the door of accessibility to those around us and increase people's ability to get where their heart is yearning to go, which is in relationship with God, which is eternity. God is, according to Solomon Ecclesiastes, God has written eternity in the heart of every man. Every heart is yearning to go into eternity. Every heart is longing for a relationship with the eternal, with the ascended God. And we are the accessibility feature. We are the ones who make it easier for people to get there. Our life of love provides light in the darkness of a sin-ravaged world, lighting the pathway to Christ, making it more accessible to those who so desperately need it. As you and I practice love, others become aware of Christ. They see God and they experience his love for them. What's the goal of the Incarnation? God's purpose in sending His one and only Son is to demonstrate His love for us and to enable us to live a new, flourishing kind of life, eternal life, here and now, and to invite us to join in the mission of making His love known to those who need it desperately. The question for us today is, how will we make His love accessible to those around us this week? Make a plan. Don't pause. Don't think, oh, I can put that off. What are you going to do? What am I going to do this week to make the love of God accessible to those around us? What are you and I going to do to make God embodied and visible to those in our workplaces, at the grocery store, on our way here and there, the people that we connect with online? How are we going to make ourselves more accessible? We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. He is key. Verse 13 of this passage, we didn't read it, but it's there. The Holy Spirit is critical in this whole process. Holy Spirit, fill us. And we must allow our love for God to grow into our love for others. And we must open the door. As we praise God, as we exalt Him, as we obey Him, the door comes open and the love of God should also come out to those around us. We express our love for God, the door is open, and His love for them should flow from us to them. The one thing, the one thing, for us as Christians, is living a life of love. There is no important thing than practicing love, the love that God has shown to us. I'm going to ask you to get your communion items together right now, bread and cup if you would please, and let's just take a moment and pray. We have a number of friends who are sick, some friends who are grieving and struggling right now, and we want to take just a pause and pray for our friends who are in a very dark time, and our society is in general. So as a part of our communion, an expression of our love for God and for those around us, we are going to pray that God would minister, that God would heal, that God would, that God would come alongside. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. And Father, today we are grateful for the sacrifice that you've made for us. We are grateful for how you've ministered your grace to us. And as we think of that, our hearts, we are recipients of your great love, and our hearts go out to our friends who are in desperate need of love. We think of friends who are grieving through this period of time right now, the Nguyen's family, the Young family, and others who are grieving. And we pray in Jesus' name that your love would be demonstrated, demonstrated through this body, demonstrated through other friends and family, that your love would hold them up and undergird them. We pray for friends who are struggling with depression, who are struggling in jobs and, and with their finances. And we pray that we would be able to come alongside them and love them in ways that are sacrificial during this time. Help us to be your demonstration, the embodiment of your love to these dear friends. And Lord, as we hold this bread that symbolizes that embodiment, we pray that you would bless it and that, that our hearts would well up with joy and thanksgiving of humble gratitude as we celebrate the gift of your Son for us. Bless this bread, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Lord, today we are thankful for the new covenant in your blood. We are reminded that by your stripes we are healed. And we think of friends who are struggling with a variety of different illnesses, who are bedridden, who are in the hospital, Lord, who are fearful. And we just pray in Jesus' name. 
that you would heal them, that you would strengthen them, that you would come alongside them, that the blood of Jesus that was shed for them would avail for them in this hour, that your power, your presence would rest upon them right where they're at, right now. Bring healing, bring strength, bring peace of mind where there is no peace of mind. Bring comfort where there is heartache. And we pray that you bless this cup as we remember your gift to us. In Jesus' name, let's take the cup. And Father, help us to live your life of love in this community this week. Give us creativity, give us insights. You've prepared good works for us to do. We want to walk in them this week. Help us, Holy Spirit, to embody the love of God through Jesus Christ everywhere we go, that people would see you and they would find you easily accessible. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.